I wanted to maybe just also speak about some of the other changes Mm -hmm. that we see in menopause. I think that there's some shame around, you know, sexual uh, changes in terms of even even in the in the act of sex, painful sex, poor lubrication. Mm -hmm. And then in our everyday life, I think that there's more a lot of women will sort of quietly report mm-hmm. maybe to an OBGYN like yourself, more incontinence, yeah. things like that. So can we talk a little bit about some of the changes that we see from from the sort of genital urinary system and the reproductive system and the reproductive side as well? Yeah, I think it's, it's all one realm of when I think of sexual health in women specifically during this time frame, is that you're going to see physiologic changes because biologically you're going through perimenopause and menopause, which is going to decrease your estrogen, which estrogen to me is like the wonder drug. It's really responsible for so many things that I'm like, without it, that's why we start to see kind of this decline in our our lives, our functionality and quality of life. And so I want women to be not scared of or just accepting to this is going to happen. I'm just going to give up on life. I think that with understanding and having these conversations, it allows people to understand what is biologically happening, but also being able to take charge through whether that's lifestyle, whether that's behavior modification, whether it's medications that are needed or even hormone replacement therapy as a way to somewhat offload some of these changes that are occurring so that our quality of life doesn't necessarily have to plummet and not accepting that model of I'm just going to give up and life is over. So going back to sexual health, I look at it as how does the mind respond to uh, sexuality, which is more of the libido side of it. And that's more of the desire or the interest to um, be intimate. And then you have your biological physiologic portion of sexual health, which is because of the decline in estrogen, you start to have tissue changes. And that really is going to go to when you think of the pelvic area, specifically the vagina and the urine, the urinal tract or the urinary tract. That's why you start to see increase in urinary tract infections. You start to see vaginal dryness. And that really is because the estrogen is not allowing increased blood flow and it's changing the collagen in that area. So it's not as, it's not as elastic. The elasticity is going to decrease and that causes the pain in sex, which then people are just like, because we're having painful intercourse at this point, I'm going to refrain from it. So you have the mind portion of it, which is I don't really have the desire to right. partake in intimate moments. And then you have the physical aspect of that is because I have all these changes in the genitourinary system, it's painful. And now I'm going to refrain from it. So I always look at it, I pull it apart from two different angles because you have some people who may not you know, have lubrication and m- maybe don't have any issues vaginally, but their desire is gone and vice versa. And some people have both. It's important to recognize those two aspects of it and make sure that you're addressing both ends of it. So you were talking about some tissue atrophy Mm -hmm. inside the wall of the vagina. Do we also see atrophy in and around the vulva? Do we see clitoral atrophy? Mm -hmm. Are those things that we also see as well, which is then going to also kind of laying into what you're talking about? Certainly libido is multi-layered, you know, Mm -hmm. there's, there's, the relationship that you have with your partner or partners or what have you, which can be sort of more of a psychological uh, piece to it. But then if we're st- if under that declining testosterone and then declining estrogen, we're also now seeing anatomical changes mm-hmm. where it's harder for, you know, maybe the, the, the clitoris is smaller mm-hmm. than what it once was, or even just the contractions that happen during an orgasm are less strong, like the patient or the the, the person's experience of that orgasm maybe is less. Do we see uh, hormone replacement therapy also as a potential solution for that as well? Is that something that's also happening mm-hmm. too for, for women? Yeah, so funny that you mentioned that is that you, you do see changes biologically when we think of the clitoris because then you're going to have decreased sensitivity for the nerve endings in that area. And yeah. then also when we think of when we were talking about kind of the desire to have intercourse, um, you, you really see this change in testosterone levels as well, which women do have testosterone, believe it or not. We have smaller amounts than men do, but it's still very potent. And so when you have a decline in testosterone, that again is going to go to our libido and our our sex drive. But also when you think of the phases of sexual arousal and how that is, a lot of people have a longer time even 
from going from being aroused to actual climaxing as well. So that's also a feature that you see throughout this time. And that's when I think women become maybe discouraged from having intercourse because of that time frame that lengthens. And it goes again to Oh, and then you get all in, up in your head. And you're like, yeah. this is taking forever. What's exactly. wrong with me? Why can't I climb it? And then, and then that's taking you just even further away from, yeah. Cycle, it's this constant cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think that that's really good to know. I think that that's really important to know that there may be some physical features that are changing, that there's components to it that are both physiological and psychological. Mm -hmm. I wanted to jump into lifestyle, but I think before I do that, I think it might be just a great time to jump into hormone therapy yeah. because I think that this is, you know, I've heard you talk about testosterone replacement therapy for women before. I've heard you talk about, you know, menopause hormone mm -hmm. therapy, you know, hormone therapy in general. So we've had lots of guests on the show, Dr. Mary Claire Haver yeah. and Susan Gilbert Lenz, and we've all talked about the WHI. Mm -hmm. We just want to put this damn paper to bed so we can maybe skip over that briefly and get to the indications and contraindications around where hormone therapy might be appropriate so we're talking right now about sexuality potentially low libido mm -hmm. what would be an appropriate intervention for a woman and what should she be thinking about when she's going to speak to her primary care provider about you know, some of these changes, these genital urinary and these sort of sexual changes that we've been that we've been discussing, what are some of the key facts that she needs to be able to relay to her PCP in order to have a, you know, conducive discussion around what the best path is, is for her? Yeah, I think that would be a tough conversation, obviously, because when we look at testosterone, it's not one of the most popular parts of hormone replacement therapy. And then for females, you know, there is no testosterone product that's approved by the FDA. And so you will probably for more times than often get pushback from asking for testosterone in the form of it being replaced. But we do know that they decrease with time and they get to low levels. But the beauty of testosterone, when you look at it physiologically and what it contributes to, obviously we talked about libido, but there's so many other parts of the body that it contributes to. When we think of bone health, it actually improves bone density and also yeah. energy levels and brain fog. So we have receptors for all our hormones all over the body. And so I think we have kind of pigeonholed testosterone just to libido, which is very beneficial for, but there also are other benefits from taking testosterone therapy. So I would say to a woman who's going to her PCP and knows that she has decreased libido is stating the obvious is sometimes very helpful. I know that I studies have shown that testosterone can help with decreased libido for females. Is this something that we can look into? Because now you're kind of putting it back into the, you know, the lap of the physician. And at that point, if a physician is not comfortable with prescribing that or giving any recommended dosages or reasons why, then that's when you can find someone who is to give you what you need. It doesn't necessarily mean that that physician is a bad physician, but if they're not comfortable with testosterone therapy, what it's used for and how to give it, then that's their way of saying, this is something that's not in my wheelhouse. And that's okay. And they don't know how to manage it. Right. If they don't know how to manage it or, you know, titrate based on what's happening mm -hmm. for you, you actually don't want to be under that the care of that individual anyway, because they don't necessarily know what to do right. for that specific for, for that specific silo, mm -hmm. for that, you know, if we're talking about TRT in particular, if they're saying, hey, I don't, I'm not really comfortable with it. I haven't had, you know, training in it or, or whatever it is. I mean, they might not come out and tell you that, but they're just going to say something subtle, like I'm not comfortable, you know, prescribing right. that, you know, it's, it's up to us to say, okay, well, we wouldn't want to be under the care of someone who's not comfortable, you know, mm -hmm. and doesn't and, and doesn't have a lot of experience, let's say. Yeah. Um, and I don't in, think in that's a, a bad thing. I don't think people should look at someone as they don't know what they're yeah. doing. They're just not comfortable. And that's OK. Yeah. Move on to yeah. someone who is going to be able to provide you that information. Totally.